So now we're going to talk about the analytic procedures. You know, understand the logic, you know, the rationale, and you can derive the weight um, on your own following the same logic, right? Um, as long as we believe that given your particular data, it looks like you know, this, uh, this ignorability assumption is not entirely impossible. But um, with that, get nailed down. So how are we gonna actually apply it uh, to real data? So I'm gonna talk about the parametric procedure first because you know, it's, um, I would say, a direct extension of what we have learned so far, and then we'll talk about a non-parametric alternative, which isn't too hard to apply, at least for getting the point estimates. And uh, briefly summarize some simulation results, uh, just to convince everybody that it actually works. Um, and then we're gonna work with the software, you know, show some of the important features. And uh, you know, those of you who have your computer with you, you're gonna go to the website, download the software, and then we're gonna play with the data together. Um, yeah, you can download the data from the website, right, for this workshop. Um, so, so that's what we're gonna do once I do a little bit of luxury. <laughs> so the analytic procedure, you know, um, um, mainly you know, at the core, it, it involves these four steps. Step one is to get the propensity scores, right, which involves specifying propensity score model, estimate the, the coefficients, then find that for everybody a pair of propensity scores. One go in the numerator, the other one go in the denominator of the weight. Number two, with, once you have these propensity scores, you can estimate the weight. That is a time when you can either estimate, estimate the weight parametrically or non-parametrically. Parametrically, if you just directly use the, the propensity scores that you have estimated, or you can do that um, in a non-parametric manner. And then subsequently, how do we know whether these propensity score models are adequate in adjusting for you know, the second bias associated with the observed covariates? Or maybe some of the covariates are not taken care of very well so far, um, and then we should, you know, find such cases and maybe go back and, and modify your propensity score model to do a better job with adjustment. So this is a step called check and balance. Again, you can do that parametrically or non-parametrically. And then finally, if you are happy with the results so far, then you can go ahead and do the very last step, which is doing those mean contrasts, right? Estimating the cause effects. At the end, under weighting. So the first step is to, uh, like I said, estimate or predict a pair of propensity scores for, for everybody. Um, so for everyone in a treated group and uh, who was actually employed, let's say, uh, the, there's a propensity of being employed in a treated group, right? But for such people, you also want to um, predict their probability of being uh, employed in the control group. For everybody who is unemployed in a treated group, their propensity of being unemployed is just one minus this estimate propensity, right? And I find out your propensity of being employed, one minus this gives me your propensity of being unemployed if you are actually unemployed. So, so that's the first part. And, and then that will give you the, the denominator of the weight for the, for the treated people. The numerator for the treated people is your propensity of being employed if you're employed, or your propensity of being unemployed if you're unemployed, uh, under the counterfactual control condition. So here what we do that's very similar to what EMI's group was thinking, you, know, you have randomization. So if I have, in their case, if I have prediction model for M0, I can fit that model to the control group and then apply that model to the treated group. You know, similarly here, we say at least we can specify and fit a propensity score model to the control group. Find out you know, how these characteristics um, at the baseline predict your employment under the control condition. And then because of randomization, so that the treated units and the control units you know, on average are comparable, so the same model would apply to the treated group it will tell us, should these people have been counterfactually assigned to the control condition, how their background would predict their employment, right? So therefore, using this model, um, 
you, you fit the model to the control group, the propensity score model, and then apply the prediction function to the treated group, then we can predict for every treated individual their propensity of being employed or unemployed should they come to factory be in the control group. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good question, yeah. Um, what in theory it does, in theory that the ignorability assumption always involves a, a component called a positivity assumption, meaning you know, every one who is employed could, pos you know, could possibly be unemployed and vice versa, right? That's a positivity assumption. In other words, nobody was designated to be employed. Nobody has a probability. If you're employed, you don't have a probability of being one to be employed. If you do, you are, you're, uh, if you do under both conditions, you always take, <laughs> you know, uh, in the principal stratification framework. But normally, you know, when people assume ignorability, they say there are no such cases, right? Um, so when you state the, the ignorability assumptions, we may state it that way as well. Even though, yeah, in general, if there are always takers, which, you know, the positivity assumption wouldn't allow. But if they are always takers, meaning there were people who would always be employed if they're under LFA and they will always be employed under control and there were no such people among unemployed, right? That, that, that's the issue of common support. Um, what's interesting is they're not gonna cause any trouble because for these people, um, for these people, um, basically the I think that the numerator and denominator would be very similar. If the denominator, numerator and denominator would be very similar, the weight would be close to one, right? If the weight is close to one, it indicates that um, the weighted outcome and the unweighted outcome for that person is zero. And the indirect effect, that person's indirect effect is zero which fits our understanding of the indirect effect, meaning the program is not gonna affect the always takers mediator. The program is not, if you're always taking the, the program is not gonna change your employment process, right? Even though they are violating, you know, the, the concern with the comma support, but they're having such people, you know, they will contribute an indirect effect equal to zero as it should be if there are such people who are always takers or never takers. And they'll contribute the indirect effect of zero toward the average. Does that make sense? We, we, when we are estimating the average indirect, but it's, it, it's, you know, it's the average of all the people, but the indirect effect can be different for different people, right? For some people, the indirect effect could be actually zero or close to zero. For other people, it could be much larger impact. And these people we just described, who would always be employed, would contribute uh, an indirect effect equal to zero toward the average. Did I answer your question? Yes. Um, so, so we, we don't, we don't, yes, yes. We, we're not worried about them. And, and at one point, you know, uh, during this process, at one point we, we, we were worried, you know, if there are such people and then the, the employed and unemployed are incomparable because such people would only among, be among the employed and then should we drop them? You can try to drop them. It doesn't improve the results. And actually, if you don't drop them, the results look you know, even better and more precise. So we decided you know, that really there's no reason to worry about them. I think it would be an issue if you are estimating the control the direct effects. The control direct effects is like, say, y11 one, one minus y10, right? That's the control direct effect of, of the mediator on the outcome. That requires that you think of changing everyone um, from being unemployed to being employed, and this, this control effect is not defined for someone who would never be unemployed. 
right? There were no such people among the unemployed, therefore, you know, the um, control effect is in not defined for such people. But it's not an issue here when we are looking at the natural effects. So very good, good question. It got me to you know explain the whole process. You know all the struggle we we had with this, and the final decision we arrived at is you know the common support is not a, a real issue, especially when you have randomization data when the treatment is randomized. So the parametric estimation of the RMPW weights, you know you take the, the formula for the weight as you had earlier, except now the thetans are estimated or predicted. And this is showing um, when we apply the parametric RMPW, basically using the, the estimated propensity scores to, to compute the weight, and then apply it to the weight, I have the unweighted control group in which um, employment rate was close to 0.4. I have the unweighted L, uh, treated group, the employment rate is 0.65. So if I apply the weight to the treated group, it should transform the mediated distribution and it should reduce the employment rate down to 0.4. And it did happen, right? This is not exactly 0.395, but it's pretty close, given that everything was estimated. And so this is a very rough check. And strictly speaking, you expect to see this happen within every level of X or within every level of the propensity scores. So that shows that you, you, you did what you wanted to do is to transform the mediated distribution from the distribution M1 to the distribution M M0 in the treated group. And you should do the same with the control group. Um, and then balance checking. Now, every time you do propensity score, you should do balance checking. Meaning, you want to find out, you know, whether the propensity score is adjustment is, is working as you you had wished. Um, what did I write here? Let's see if the sequential ignorability assumption holds, and if these are big ifs. If the propensity score models are correct specified, then um, propensity score based parametric weighting is expected to balance the covariate distribution across. There are, well, when the treatment and, and the mediator are both binary, you have two by two, there are four cells, right? There are four treatment by mediated combinations. There are treated people employed, treated people unemployed, control people employed, control people unemployed. Those, those are four cells. Now, if propensity score adjustment was adequate, then these four cells should have the same um, pretreatment composition, should have the same distribution of the pretreatment covariates. And that's when you have balance in the observed variables, right? So how do you check it? Interesting, we can use IPTW to check that. So basically to check balance, now I'm um, using the same set of covariates as we just did before, but I'm, um, using the same, uh, now, now I'm seeing what is the propensity for you to be employed uh, if you're treated. What is your propensity of being unemployed if you're treated? For the control units, I see me, I, I'm seeing your propensity of being, basically, you know, the, the same propensities um, as I've seen before, um, but I'm using it as IPW weight. And the software that we're gonna see will generate a table like this, okay? Those are, those are the four groups, right? the four treatment T by M combinations. And I want to compare across those four subgroups to see whether every covariate has the same distribution across these four columns. And I can look at standardized difference between any two columns. I expect to see a standardized difference as small as under 0.25 in the, is the, the um, criteria adopted in the literature. Or I can do a global test, testing whether there's any 
difference across any two of the, the four groups. So, so that's checking balance, and the results will be provided in an in instant <laughs> uh, by clicking a button in the, in the software. And then if you pass the balance checking, uh, everything looks fine. Then you do the weighted estimation of the causal effects. This is the model we have seen before, just using some regression checks, uh, tricks to, to find the mean difference between those, you know, any pair of, of the four um, potential outcome averages. So there are a lot of words here. Oh, I said a little bit about estimating standard error. So if you do this in state, I'm, you know, I'm gonna give you a state code, SAS code, and R code. Um, it's just impossible to do it in the SPSS. <laughs> I forgot why it was impossible. So, uh, so in Stata, uh, you could use weighted least squares, right? Weighted regression. And initially, we were, we were uh, getting the cluster robust standard errors. The reason is we use duplicates, right? Um, say the experimental unit, every experimental um, unit was used twice, you know, one time weighted, another time unweighted. So the, the two observations are coming from the same person. So two observations, weighted and unweighted, are nested in the same person. Um, so the, each individual is a cluster, right? So in state you can cluster the original observations um, by individual ID. Um, and if you don't, we were, we were concerned that if you don't use cluster robust standard errors, then the duplicate observation create correlated errors. So this takes care of the duplication. Now, it doesn't take care of everything. Because earlier I, I mentioned there's a two-step estimation procedure involved in any propensity score-based causal inference, right? Same true here. So um, this one is taking the weight, the estimated weight, as if they were the true weight, right? So it only gives the sampling um, uncertainty from the second step estimation, ignoring the uncertainty in the first, first run, the first step, which is the propensity score estimation. Um, and in general, uh, people may think, well, what's the consequence of ignoring the, the estimation error in the first step? Does that mean when I estimate the standard errors for these gammas, I'm gonna get a, a standard error overly small because I ignore the first step uncertainty? You think you know, the, two, the uncertainty from the two steps, gonna, they're gonna add up? And maybe, and interestingly, in, in, in the IPTW literature, what they found was if we ignore the first step estimation, using the estimated weight as true weight, you get a standard error that's too large. Meaning if you take into account the two steps of estimation, you should get a standard error. The true standard error should be smaller. It's interesting, right? Do I have, well, I haven't, I haven't seen that explanation in the literature. It's an empirical finding. Um, we have simulated, you know, the cases in which we know the true weight. So in the simulated data, you can have the true weight, right? And then you have the estimated weight. It should remind me if I'm wrong. Um, I think using the estimated weight, uh, and then we look at the true standard error, okay? Um, which might not be exactly answering this question, but when you use the estimated weight, the weight that has been tailored to your sample data, um, your point of estimate of a causal effect becomes more precise, meaning your true standard error is smaller than when you use the true weight. The true weight is the weight that you, know, you use to generate the data, um, which doesn't reflect anything idiosyncratic about a particular sample. Yeah, yeah, so, so sample estimated weight um, gives you more precise estimate of the cause effects than the true weight. And this, you know, I think is also what Rosenbaum found in the 
um, in his article in 1987, they said in general, you know, even if you know the true propensity score, and you have the estimated propensity score, you should prefer using the estimated propensity score rather than the true score. Because the estimated score is tailored to your sample, so it takes better care of whatever, not just the systematic bias, but also noise in your sample. Right? Just, you know, it's like in a randomized experiment. Um, in a randomized experiment, in expectation, the propensity score is a constant for everybody, right? So the true propensity score is a constant for everyone. But if you estimate the propensity score with randomized data, you will find it to be different from person to person. And that, that variation in the propensity score captures noise in your sample. Therefore, adjust for the estimated propensity score helps you to remove some of the noise and it improves your precision. So, so that's a contrast between true weight and estimated weight. Now here, it, it, it's a slightly different issue. It's about you know, viewing your estimated weight as something true or as something estimated. So I don't have the best intuition. I don't know, Shu, what would you say about it? Yeah, so unlike IPTW, IP, in IPTW they reported a consistent grade. Um, using your, your estimated as a true weight lead to um, a standard error that's overestimated. But in RMPW, in the case of RMPW, it can go either way. And we have simulated data to show you that in some cases, you overestimate standard error. In other cases, you underestimate standard error. But there are also many scenarios in which the standard error was not affected that much. So, um, but anyhow, so is there a solution to that? Um, we um, have applied a procedure, you know, um, coming from the statistical literature saying that you should, you should estimate the two steps simultaneously. As people do in structural equation modeling, as people do uh, in two stage least squares when they analyze the two stages simultaneously, <laughs> right? So the, the first step estimation is accounted for in the second step as well. So, um, but this, you know, we found it to be equivalent to a procedure that has been implemented in state of the generalized method moments procedure uh, initially uh, proposed by Lars Hansen, an economist. And so when we invoked this GMM procedure in STATA, we got exactly the same results as we did with uh, using you know, the other procedure called M estimation procedure, which is simultaneous estimation of the two steps. Um, so it shows that the two procedures, you know, sounded like two different theories, but really they are equivalent in nature when applied to this kind of problem. So we, were, we have been able to estimate asymptotic standard errors, right, that account for the fact that weight was estimated. So that's a, what we have to say about standard error. It's not that trivial um, in some cases. So here we're gonna look at some results. Total effect decomposition. Um, the total effect, remember, was close to zero. And just to remind ourselves, what was our hypothesis about the direct effect and the indirect effect? What, what did we say about direct effect? Is if, if everybody um, was assigned to the new policy rather than staying under the old policy, but counterfactually, if everybody's employment status doesn't change, right? Um, how would the change in your treatment assignment affect your depression if your employment status doesn't change? Right, so if just as under the control condition, even if people are all assigned to the new policy, still you have 40% people, only 40% of people employed and 60% um, of people unemployed what would be the average depression level in comparison with the case where everybody is now treated but as many as 65% of people are employed. Remember we're contrasting Y1M0 with Y0M0, right? Which case will give you a higher depression level when the employment rate is only 40%? 
we think people will be more depressed if they are treated, or they will be more depressed if they are untreated. You know, at the beginning of the day, we said, you know, we think they're going to be more depressed if they were treated. Why? Because as many as 60% of people are unemployed, and employment matters if they are treated. It doesn't matter that much if they are untreated, right? It matters in the case that if you remain untreated, you will no longer be eligible for welfare. You will be under all the pressure. Right, you, you're going to lose the only source of income probably, and you still have all the stress you have to deal with in life. Right, so, so for the people, if the unemployment rate is high, and for these people, the policy creates a, a environment even more stressful than otherwise it would be. So we hypothesize that there will be a, a positive direct effect. And we, we had this 1.29 as a point estimate. And remember, the, the standard deviation of the outcome was like 7.5. So this is uh, more than 10%, maybe 13%, 15% of a standard deviation. The effect size is small, but um, I, would say, I wouldn't say it's, it's completely ne negligible, even though you know, we, we don't have uh, a p-value that's low enough to, to reach statistical significance. But that has to do with with precision. So it's possible that if you improve precision, you may um, find this, this number um, distinguishable from zero. So for now, at least the direction is the same as we had hypothesized. And what did we say about indirect? This is the natural indirect effect, uh, which is Y1M1 minus Y1M0, right? This is saying now policy has changed the employment rate, increasing from 40% to 65%. Now, if everybody were treated, would this increase in employment rate affect depression? And if it does, in which direction? When more people are becoming employed under the new policy, should depression level go up or down? You know, in other words, you are consider, you're comparing two scenarios. Um, in both scenarios, you have the new welfare to work policy in place where everybody is required to actively seek employment, otherwise they are threatened to, be san to receive sanction. In one scenario, you have as many as 65% of people employed, in another scenario, only 40% employed. In which scenario will depression level go higher? The second one. The second one, yeah, the second one, right. So, so this is the contrast. Um, so, in other words, when you change from 40% to 65% employment rate under the treated condition, the depression level should go down. So we anticipate a, a negative indirect effect, natural indirect effect. And we do have a negative point estimate, and interestingly, we have a much more precise estimate of, of the indirect effect than the direct effect. And it's understandable, if understandable because for the indirect effect, we're using the same group twice. By using the same group, it's like using someone's gain score. Right? The gain score is more precise than a, a single observation. So using the, the, the same group twice gives an estimate of indirect effect that's quite precise. While for the direct effect, we use the treated group once or use the control group once. So these are two groups, you know, two independent samples. So it gives you more noise than using the same group twice. So with this um, more precise estimation, we actually uh, have indication that this negative point A7 is close to being significant. It's, it was pretty close, yeah. Not exactly the same. Um, It's not exactly the same because this one involves the estimation of the propensity scores, while the ITT effect estimation doesn't. So when you estimate propensity scores, you, you bring in some you know, um, sampling error, right?
what was the, um, do you have it in the you know, handout? What was the ITT effect? I gave you earlier. Point one one. So this different, uh, you add these two numbers, it's more than point one one. Yeah, point four two, yeah. That's a good question, yeah. Right, because so we use the same treated group outcome average, right, unweighted, you use the same control group outcome average unweighted. And we use the same sample. Yeah, let me look in, the, but, but these are the, I would, you know, my, my explanation is these are the results I got from our paper. And when we wrote, it, this is the JEBS paper that uh, I listed in, in the references. And I think when we did the analysis, we probably didn't use the entire sample. Um, I think in that paper we were, we were still struggling with the common support issue and we actually excluded a few cases that were considered to be, you know, like people who are nearly always takers. So it, it's not exactly the same sample as, as we know, um, the 694 people I used earlier to report the ITT effect. It's, it's the difference in the sample that led to the, the difference. If you use the 694 people, you should have add up, yeah, should have had it, uh, added up to 0.11. So in that paper, we talk about comma support, but after that, after that paper was done, and after a while, we decided well, it really doesn't matter. Uh, why is it an issue? Yeah. No, why, why do you think it, it looks well, like you have a concern about it? So may, can you, let me just explain, maybe, maybe it would help me if you just sort of explain again um, what you sort of said in passing, like the standard of application of the first year. Right, so, so the analogy would be, you know, if, if you are looking at the uh, treatment impact um, achievement, right? If you look at a one-time you know, observation of achievement, you have a standard error based on that one observation. I think if you look at the treatment impact on a gain score, this gain score is, um, has in general should contain less measurement error than the one-time observation. The, the gain score is Y1 minus Y0, right? So the variance of, I'm sorry? No, so the variance of Y1 minus Y0 is the variance of y1 plus variance of y0 minus two times the covariance of y1 and y0. And the covariance of y1 and y0 is, should be pretty large because y1 and y0 are highly correlated. So it should have less variance. So when you use gain score as the outcome, right, the, the error variance will be smaller. Oh, it's not, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not a measurement error, sorry. It's not a measurement error. It's, it's between individual variation. So the variance of y and the variance, it's not, it's not measurement error in y. It's the between individual variation in y, right? So, so the covariance between y1 and y0, um, yeah, it, it should, should be high, so we, Uh, because, you know, 
as I have shown um, earlier, we, we have the, the uh, unweighted treated group and the unweighted control group, the control C, the ITT. But if you wanted the counterfactual, I want to see what happened to the treated group, what would be the outcome if the unemployment rate um, was the same as another control condition. I have to use the treated group again, but I transformed the their mediated distribution, right, to get the third potential outcome. Right, so this is the second time I use the, the treated group. And, and, and for the indirect effect, what I'm contrasting is the average unweighted outcome of the treated group uh, between the unweighted average outcome of the treated group and the weighted average outcome of, it, of the same group. Right. So, so that difference on average is like the average game score. So then I added in the pure indirect effect, which uses a fourth potential outcome, which was weighted differently using that weight, you know, on, on the whiteboard, applied to the control group. Um, so you have the weighted average outcome of the control group contrasted with the um, unweighted average outcome of the control group. That contrast was 0.32, and that contrast is telling us if everybody was under the old policy where um, welfare was guaranteed. You changing employment rate from 40% to 65%, is that gonna affect them psychologically? And we thought, you know, pro probably not, not that much because employment was not at issue. You know, it, it wasn't required for maintaining welfare. Uh, it doesn't change, if it doesn't change much of everything else, then uh, we expect this cause effect to be close to zero. And um, at least, you know, by the point estimate, this much smaller in magnitude, uh, much closer to zero. And this part is interesting, right? This natural treatment by median interaction effect is the contrast between these two things. It's a difference in difference. So if employment matters when everybody is treated, and it doesn't matter as much when everybody is untreated, how big is the difference? And the difference shows to what extent the treatment changed the mediated outcome relationship. The extent to which the treatment changed how employment affects your psychological well-being. Right, and it looks like it changed significantly. This is the largest point estimate, or oh, not the largest, but, but you know, uh, one of the largest, and, and this is the one that shows statistical significance. That's exactly what we're doing. That's not coincidence. That, that, that's how we got, that's what, how we got this. This is the difference between those two. Right. And this exactly saying now how the immediate outcome relationship depends on whether you are treated. This is when you're treated. And this is the relationship when you're untreated. Right, so if the immediate outcome relation depends on whether you're treated or untreated, then you will have a significant interaction effect, yeah. Uh, right, right, so, so if we, you know, live back uh, in a, during the time, in the middle of the Clinton administration, there's this huge debate going on in the Congress. Right, all the Republicans want to win the people of welfare. Right, you know, yeah. That that's why. That that's why because because under the old policy called AFDC, nobody cares. Their argument is nobody cares about looking for a job, because they could continue to live on welfare and they will never be weaned unless you put pressure on them. 
the way they put pressure on them is going to tell everybody, now you got to go out and look for a job. Otherwise, you, know, you won't be entitled to welfare anymore. Right? Yeah, yeah. So put everybody under pressure. Uh, no, positively, give them encouragement, give them support. And then negatively, they are threatening everybody. <laughs> you know, there's a consequence if you, you don't take your, you know, this seriously. That's why. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You might become less depressed if you find a job under the new regime because you know that you, you meet the, the expectation. Like there's a challenge and you're able to overcome the challenge. You know, that could have a positive impact. And uh, under the old policy, there isn't such a challenge, right? Oh yeah, yeah, that yeah, that that's what we used to, to get these estimates. Yeah. Uh, all you need is an intercept. I didn't report. I didn't report the intercept here, but I remember the intercept is somewhere around like a seven point something. Like assume that the intercept was seven. Remember the average depression score was was seven, right? Seven point five. So let's say the intercept is is seven. So intercept is uh, the average y zero m zero. Right. So um, average y0 m0 um, is the one to be subtracted from uh, here, to be subtracted from y1 m0, right? So, so the average y1 L m0 is um, this number plus the intercept. And intercept is the number to be subtracted from y, um, y0 m1. So add this number to the intercept gives you y0 m1. So on and so forth. Then, then you, can, you can figure out the rest of it. <laughs> so you know those four marginal potential outcomes is what we have identified through weighting. And then we take those four things, we do you know, pairwise comparisons um, to generate these estimates. So now I'm gonna talk about, you know, that we understand that the downside, you know, uh, the, the nice thing, you know, we, now we look at the interaction effect and uh, um, we, we didn't have to specify a functional form of the outcome model, therefore we avoid a lot of the uh, potential pitfalls. Um, but we still had to specify a propensity score model, which could be wrong, which could be consequential. Uh, that's, that's a motivation for looking for non-parametric solution. So after we have estimated those propensity scores, how do you compute the weight? There's a non-parametric way of computing the weight. So remember everybody has a pair of propensity scores based on the estimation. And in the non-parametric procedure, we're gonna stratify on one propensity score, then substratify on the second propensity score. And then after these you know, double sub substratification, um, and then we re-estimate the propensity score non-parametrically. So here is uh, an illustration. Um, this is your propensity of being employed under control condition, this is your propensity of being employed under treated condition, and everybody has a pair of these two propensity scores. So first you stratify on one of these two propensity scores, you can choose three or four or five, depending on how big your sample is, right? You created four strata, and then within each of them, along the dimension of the other propensity score, I stratify them again. So if you use four by four stratification, now I have 16 cells. And then within every little cell, choose any 
one of these cells, these people are relatively homogeneous in their propensity of being employed and when they're treated and in their propensity of being employed when they're untreated. So these people are much more similar to each other than when you look at the entire sample, right? So that, that's the basic idea of uh, propensity score stratification and propensity score matching is a more extreme <laughs> version of it. So now look at this little cell. I just zoomed in and I'm focusing on this one. And in this little cell, I should have four subgroups. Number one, I have people who are treated and untreated. And among the people who are, sorry, among the people who are treated, I have people who are employed or unemployed. And in this is for illustration, let's say in this little, you know, they represent a subgroup, subgroup, a subpopulation of people, right, who, who are uh, much more homogeneous than, than general. And then let's say here in a treated group, I find, I look at the proportion of people who are actually employed among the treated, I may find the proportion to be 0.5, right? And, and the proportion of um, being unemployed when treated is also 0.5. So this is my newly estimated propensity of being employed for the treated people in this cell. And it might be different from the propensity score for being treated when, uh, being employed when treated um, that I got earlier. I should probably, earlier I should, I, I used the theta I had earlier, right? Um, earlier I had theta, sorry, just to be clear. This theta m1 equals one is the, the propensities that I have estimated by fitting the model to the treated group and that model could have been fitted um, um, with, with problems, right? So now I have a newly estimated propensity score just based on the cell counts, just based on the frequencies among the treated people, you know, how many are employed and this is a new estimate based on my observation. It doesn't require any models here. That's why it becomes non-parametric in, in nature. And I do the same among the control people. If, you know, let's say I have um, 15 people um, here and 30% of them are employed in, in un, untreated group and in a control group, then the newly estimated propensity score for being uh, treated under the control condition is 0.3. And it could be different from the parametrically estimated say they had M0. It's purely based on the cell counts I have here. So this is, um, I would say, um, exempted from the model specification errors we worry about for the propensity score models. So we expect you know, this, this new estimated, newly estimated propensity scores, because they are not based on any specific models, they should be um, somewhat robust, um, even if the, the initial models were, were wrongly specified. So the idea is within each string, we will re-estimate everybody's propensity scores on the basis of the cell counts. Uh, so here, you know, I'm changing the, the two models instead of putting in the covariates that I, I use to predict the propensity scores and put in this little s indicating which of, you know, one of these 16 cells, which one you are in, right? That's your stratum membership. Um, so within each stratum, I create this ratio of the two proportions. Those are the two proportions. Uh, for example, this one, m equals one, t equals zero, s equals s. This is simply the proportion of the control group members in stratum, in stratum S who are employed, which we estimate the propensity of employment under control condition for those in this, in this same stratum. So, so that's how we do it non-parametrically. You know, it's, um, there's not, nothing fancy here. It's just extending the propensity score stratification idea to this case, except now we have two propensity scores, so we just stratify them along the two dimensions. And other than that, it's just the same as 
propensity stratification. So, and then we do balance checking also non-parametrically. Um, so now we're saying if the sequential ignorability assumption holds, but we don't have to say if the propensity school model is, is correctly specified. We don't have to say that anymore. If the sequential ignorability assumption holds, we think that the propensity school based the non-parametric weighting, um, the, weight, you know, the weighting that's based on stratification um, is expected to balance the covariate distribution across the treatment by media combinations in across those four columns, T, T by M four columns. We expect every covariate to distribute evenly. Um, so earlier we check a balance when we have parametric weighting, we check balance using IPTW. Now since we are using a non-parametric way to estimate the weight, when we check a balance, we use a non-parametric counterpart <laughs> um, of of weighting called MMWS, it's a marginal mean weighting through so stratification. You know, I have a series of papers on that. And then we have a separate software to do MMWS, and then we build it in there to do the um, to do the checking balance uh, in the, in the non-parametric line of, of the analysis. Um, Basically, the idea is instead of using the directly estimated propensity score, we take the, the estimated propensity score to stratify the sample. And then within each stratum, we, we re-estimate the propensity score based on the proportion of people who are in each group. Um, so the, the, the re-estimated the non-parametric weight is based on the proportions that we observe in each propensity stratum. So that's the basic idea. Um, and we know that MMWS is more robust than the IPTW based on a whole series of simulation results. And the same true here, we, we expect the non-parametric RNPW to be more robust than the parametric RNPW, even if the propensity score models were misspecified, like missing nonlinear terms, missing interaction terms, it won't be as consequential now. Uh, that's our starting point. It's like, you know, when you, when you do anything in the radio, but you need to have starting values. So those are like our starting values. Yeah. But of course, there, there's no iteration involved here, but it's the same idea that you have some things to start with. <laughs> it's, it's a summary, but um, it's like, imagine, you know, the, um, I cannot draw it on anything, but imagine the relationship was nonlinear, right? So, um, and you, you fit, your initial model fit a linear line, right? So the, the fitted line doesn't reflect the true relationship, right? But you take that fitted linear line and you segment it, you stratify it. And then within each stratum, you re-estimate, you know, based on the proportions, it's gonna much better, you know, reflect the original nonlinearity. Yeah, so that's the idea. So um, now here are the non-parametric results in the second column. You know, you can compare side by side with the parametric results. Uh, the results are not that different, suggesting that maybe there wasn't any serious misspecification <laughs> in the propensity score models. There, there are some small differences. Um, what else do you observe? What? Yeah, the same errors are going down. That's something else you would often gain by going for stratification. Like, like what I found, you know, in MMWS in comparison with IPTW, IPTW tends to have a larger variance. So the weight can go much smaller or much higher when you use IPTW, the directly estimated, using directly estimated propensity score to create a weight, right? The, the, the Estimated propensity scores can be much closer to zero or one. You end up having weight, you know, going more to the extreme, right? But when you when you um, stratify it, and and then you know observe the proportions and the re-estimated weight, the re-estimated weights are much more stable. They have a much smaller variance. When the variance of the weight is smaller, the estimates are more precise. So that's generally true in, in the um, sampling literature. In general, yeah, I would say so.
Aha. Is this the one? Uh, which ones? These ones? Both are low. You know, both numbers are low here. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It could, but still, you know, using these proportions, you get a ratio um, that's not as extreme as using the initial estimated thetas. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yes. Um, well, in general, um, okay, so if your propensity score models were correct, correct right, um, and you use the, the directly estimated propensity score to create a ratio that gives you, let's say that gives you the true weight. Um, and then when you use the true weight, you get the, the point estimated cause effects that are unbiased. And then when you use this non-parametric method, you're right, you know, I'm applying the same ratio to all the people in this, in this cell. And I'm introducing some more sampling error. Um, and the ratio might not be exactly right for everyone. Um, and in fact, um, you know, unless you have large enough sample, you can subdivide it into a higher number of strata. strata um, and then your, your non-parametric weight will be getting closer and co closer converge to the true weight. Otherwise, you know, your non-parametric weight contains more sampling variability than the parametric weight um, when the parametric weight is based on the correct models. Yeah, so, so I'm worried about this problem. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's a, okay. Oh, it's the same number. It's the same number of people in every cell. So I evenly divide. No, it, it's not a divide according to the, the distance. It's according. So I put you know when when I divide it into four, I divide it into four quartiles. I have twenty five percent of people in each, in each of those four columns. And here, yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. Right, right, right. Right. Yeah. But the same is true in the numerator. The numerator I is getting smaller, right? Because they are at the, at the lower, lower end of the tail, and they. Yeah, they anytime you anytime you have an estimator that relies on divided by some error size, right? Yeah. I get worried when that denominator is smaller and lower than the very less that estimator is going to be. Well th that that would be true if the numerator is a constant, but here the numerator and the denominator are, are both, you know, prone to the same amount of error, I could argue. Right? Because I can switch these two, right? I can I can sub subdivide these first, or no, no matter what. Um, it's it's the same degree of, I think it's the same degree of error in the numerator and denominator.
I'm not keeping track of time, so somebody had to help me with it. <laughs> All right, yeah, so um, I, we, we saw this nonparametric uh, results, and here's the entire set of results, and again, you can, you can do the comparison. Um, this, you know, uh, not that different from, so in general, I would say, you are seeing this becoming truly significant now, and this one um, also with a slightly larger point estimate and slightly small, smaller standard error, and then you, are, you are gaining more confidence in saying that the, the, the treatment interaction effect um, is significant. And all the interpretations is uh, as the same as before. And I quickly summarize the simulation results. Um, actually, I do need to look at it. Um, so this is, you know, um, in the paper in JEBS, you know, we simulated data very similar to the, the new Riverside data, and then we tried both parametric and non-parametric procedures, and then we found them to be both performing generally well, and interestingly, if your propensity score models were correct, so parametric IMPW removes nearly 100% of the bias. 100% of bias, non-parametric IMPW with four by four stratification as I have shown you, removes 90% of bias. If you cannot afford four by four because your sample is smaller, you can do three by four or three by three. If you have three by three stratification, you have nine cells, you still remove 85% of the bias, which is not too bad. We know that in the stratification literature, you know, typically, you know, when you you are evaluating the treatment impact, and you, you create a five strata, and everybody is, is citing Cochrane 1957, saying you know, with five strata you remove 90% um, of the bias, right? So then, um, the advantages of non-parametric RMPW in comparison with parametric RMPW so far, what we have seen is we have seen is the non-parametric results tend to be relatively more efficient in many cases, and uh, there's evidence that it truly it's more robust uh, than the parametric method when the propensity score models are misspecified when I, and when I'm omitting nonlinear, non-additive terms. Um, this is two-step estimation I mentioned earlier. I don't want to say too much about it, but we have this, this Standalone on PW software that we're going to download and increments this M estimation procedure and it gives us asymptotic standard errors that correctly captures sampling um, an estimation uncertainty in, in both in both steps and you can apply a GMM procedure in data that give you the equivalent results and the GMM commands are in this technical report led by um, Ed Bian and other people on our research team. So now we're going to look at the software. I hope everybody's ready for some uh, work with real data. So you go to this website, um, and this website will always be there. That's hmsoft.net, uh, my username jong, and then it shows something like this. It says, click here to get RMPW. Then they also give you a sample RMPW data set, but don't use that data because I, I have, I, I'm giving you the, the, a subset of the news data that we can practice with. And the, one of the handouts we give you is the program menu. So um, I didn't put in help buttons on every page of the window interface. So right now you have to refer to this menu if you have questions. I think it would be much easier if we just put help buttons there. And we say, you know, we, we, we have done a lot of debugging with the program. That's the pain with writing any program. Um, you have to work with a programmer, you know, testing with various data files, you know, to see what kind of issues that might come up. And so we cannot guarantee that there will be no more bugs in there. So if anybody sees any when you're trying with it, you should let us know and we'll fix it. 